Later in life, they resumed their friendship and died on the exact same day, July 4, 1826. Welcome to David and Rachel's Traveling Adventures. Most of us already know that Thomas Jefferson is the father of the Declaration of Independence and was the President of the United States. But I bet a lot of people don't know the story of Monticello, and most won't know how the building continues to retain 90% of what it was when Jefferson last lived in the house. Well, on today's show, we are going to take you on a tour of the first floor of Monticello along with some of the grounds and provide you the stories about the rooms and the grounds, as well as how it has remained almost the same as when Jefferson saw it 200 years ago. Our third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, was born on April 13, 1743, on his father's plantation known as Shadwell, at the foothill of the Blue Ridge Mountains. But how it came about is Thomas Jefferson was born just down the mountains that you came up to get here. His father's home was called Shadwell. It's about two miles away. So Thomas Jefferson's born here in 1743. So when Jefferson was born, it's the frontier. He rides his horse up here to this mountain and dreams about building his house here one day. And it was in 1768, at the age of 25, that he contracted the clearing of 5,000 acres of property at the topmost point of the Shadwell property known as Monticello today. It would take the better part of 40 years of building and rebuilding to complete the home at Monticello that he would call his essay in architecture. Monticello survives almost in the same condition as it was when Jefferson lived in the house, thanks to its two major owners of the period from the same family, Uriah Phillips Levy and his nephew, Jefferson Monroe Levy. Uriah decided to buy it and preserve it for the nation, and Jefferson Levy also had the same philosophy, which is truly amazing. Now let's begin the tour. As you enter the Grand Hall, or the entry into Monticello, you are greeted by a plethora of artifacts that resemble a homage to natural history and Western civilization. During the period of the Age of Enlightenment that Jefferson lived in, he believed that knowledge was power, and this room was designed to help educate the guests that visited him. In the room, there are references to American Indian culture. After doubling the size of the United States with the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark westward where they encountered 40 American Indian nations that they traded diplomatic gifts with, and a lot of those gifts are in Monticello to this day. Also in the grand entrance hall is Jefferson's weekly calendar clock that was powered by gravity that worked on a system of pulleys, ropes, and cannonball weights, each of them weighing 18 pounds. On the right side of the entrance, as the weight descends, you can tell the day of the week. The clock was designed for another house that he lived in in Philadelphia, and it doesn't quite fit exactly at Monticello. So he had to cut a hole in the floor, the size of the weight and the ball, where it can go down into the basement, where the Saturday marker is located. The clock is also a two-sided clock that is visible from the outside, but this clock only has one hand. During Jefferson's retirement years, his daughter Martha Jefferson Randolph and her husband and 12 children also lived at Monticello. This is a south square room that was used by his daughter Martha Jefferson Randolph as a sitting room and a place to manage the work of the enslaved domestic servants. Of his 130 enslaved men, women, and children at Monticello, about 15 worked as domestic workers in the house. Also in this room is a commemorative engraving of the Declaration of Independence. It's hard to believe that Jefferson was only 33 when the Second Continental Congress chose him to draft the Declaration of Independence. Once you depart the South Square Room, you will enter Jefferson's library. Jefferson once had a collection of 7,000 books of seven different languages. The books were divided into three main categories, reason, memory, and imagination. He sold his collection to Congress in 1815 for $24,000. It would take 10 wagon loads of pine boxes filled with books to be transported to Washington. This room maintained his scientific apparatuses, and it is where he designed the University of Virginia, which he called his hobby for his old age. Jefferson believed that an educated society was essential to the survival of democracy. You also can see a theodolite in this room, which is a surveyor's tube that Jefferson used to map his land. Next, we are going into the cabinet room. The cabinet room is where Jefferson answered thousands of letters, recorded the weather, and even managed the plantation. It is a very functional space that housed books, papers, works of art, and even the Declaration of Independence. In the front of the desk is a polygraph machine. This isn't the same type of polygraph machine that we think of today that can tell whether you tell the truth or not. No, this type of polygraph is a copying machine. It has two pens and Jefferson would write with one of them and the other pen duplicated his writings on a second piece of paper. It's a pretty neat system. Also in this room is a bust of John Adams. John Adams worked very closely with Jefferson on the Declaration of Independence. The two later became rivals and members of opposite political parties. 
Later in life, they resumed their friendship and died on the exact same day, July 4th, 1826. Oddly enough, this date also happened to be the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The cool thing about this room and the next room is a bed that is situated in an alcove between the two rooms, saving space and providing efficiency. Jefferson actually installed alcove beds throughout his entire house. In the next room, which is connected by this bed, is the bedchamber. Being the most private room in the house, it contained many items that he would have considered to be comforts and conveniences. The cool thing about this room is that it is only lit by the light outside, and it is one of the brightest rooms in the house. The skylight, windows, and mirrors helped to make this room bright. Jefferson rose each morning when it was light enough to see the hands of his obelisk clock, which he designed at the foot of his bed. Another cool feature about this room, and the use of space, is the closet above his bed. There was a door next to the alcove for the bed where he most likely would climb a ladder to get access to his walk-in closet. The three holes above the bed were there to provide light into the closet because of course there was no electricity in this day. This is a really cool feature. The parlor room was the center of social light at Monticello. This is where you would find family members, friends gathering to talk, to play games, or listen to music. It is also a place where other important events would have been held, including dances and weddings. In the parlor you can find a lot of Jefferson's works of art, including portraits of people that he admired and considered noteworthy. Being a musician myself, I love seeing cool things such as this English guitar. The geometrically framed parquet floor was most likely designed based on examples from Jefferson's time that he spent in Paris from 1784 to 1789 as the Minister of France. As we enter the dining room, it is hard not to spot the bright colored paint. The yellow paint would have initially been painted on these walls in 1815. At that time, chrome yellow paint cost more than 33 times the conventional white paint, and it would certainly show one man's wealth on display. Jefferson's family and guests would have eaten in this room twice a day. Back in the day, the food would have been cooked and served by slaves. The room was designed to minimize the number of servants that would need to come into the room. In some respect, it provided efficiency for the slaves, such as a dumbbell waiter that was constructed and concealed in the niche of the wall where slaves below the room could send up wine from the cellar or empty bottles returned with ease. There was a side entrance to the dining room that had a swivel door where those transporting the food could put the food on shelves and rotate it around for the server to take into the dining room. The dining room was on the far left side of the house and the kitchen was below and on the far right side of the house, creating a lot more work for the servants. The tea room served as an extension to the dining room where it could be used for overflow seating. Jefferson referred to the tea room as his most honorable suite as he could display his likenesses of notable friends and American heroes. Once you exit the main house, there are a number of neat things to visit around the house including the very first room that Jefferson built at Monticello for he and his wife and the cellar where the wine and beer were stored. You could also see a carriage that he would use that would literally ring a bell when you got to a certain distance. This may be one of the first odometers. In addition, you can view not only the kitchen, but the room where the slave chef would have lived. There are also rooms that tell you stories of the people that were slaves of Jefferson's, and even some stories of their descendants. Once you leave the main premises, take a walk along Mulberry Road, where enslaved people labored here from dawn to dusk six days a week, cultivating Jefferson's field and serving his family. It was lined with workshops, sheds, and dwellings where it was occupied by craftsmen and slaves alike. Along Mulberry Road, you can also see Sally Hemmings cabin, the garden where some of the seats given to Jefferson by the tribes that Lewis and Clark visited on their journey out west, as well as other buildings like the textile workshop. After you pass through Mulberry Road, you will eventually come down to the graves of some of the family members that owned the house throughout the years, as well as the grave of Thomas Jefferson. We thoroughly enjoyed our time at Monticello, and afterwards we decided to drive to the University of Virginia to visit the famous rotunda that was designed by Jefferson as his retirement project. The rotunda and the initial buildings of the University of Virginia were known by Jefferson as the Academical Village, referencing the principle of lifelong learning. The rotunda is modeled after the Pantheon, which is a second century temple in Rome. Construction began in 1822 and it was completed in 1828, two years after Jefferson's death in 1826. Today, with Monticello and the Academical Village, is recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. After the University of Virginia, we had dinner at the Sultan Kebab, which is one of the highest rated restaurants on TripAdvisor in Charlottesville. Sultan Kebab is located at 333 2nd Street Southeast in Charlottesville. The straightforward atmosphere of the restaurant gives you the feeling of being in Turkey right off the Bosphorus Strait with the murals and the pictures of artifacts. The Turkish pizza was pretty good, but not what we expected to be the typical Turkish pie, which is a little bit disappointing. However, the eggplant and red pepper appetizer was fantastic. 
We all fought to have the last bite. Finally, you have to save room for dessert. The canefe takes about 15 minutes to make, but it was worth every bite. Rachel and I spent some time in Turkey about 10 years ago, and this restaurant ranks right up there in the real deal for Turkish food. Well, we had a great time in Charlottesville and Monticello, and obviously a great meal. If you have any other suggestions on places to visit in Charlottesville or in this Blue Ridge Valley, please put them in the notes below. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you on another adventure.